Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And on behalf of EESI, uh, we want to welcome you to this briefing this afternoon uh, to take a look at what's in the Paris climate deal and indeed how did we get there, 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 get We're going to take a look at that this afternoon. I think we have a wonderful panel to kind of lead us through that in terms of what happened, why, what is it, and indeed bringing us perspectives not only from here in the United States, uh, and we will hear from one of our lead negotiators with regard to that, but also to have perspectives from the host country of those Paris negotiations, as well as hearing from uh, a counselor at the German embassy. Germany has obviously been an enormously important climate leader for a very, very long time. So to start off our discussion this afternoon, uh, as we take a look at, at this global agreement that involved virtually every country in the world, uh, which is something that is sobering and also very, very exciting uh, to understand, to comprehend. Our first speaker will be Dan Dr. Daniel Reefsnyder, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment at the State Department. Dr. Reefsnyder has been the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for environment since 2006, uh, where he is responsible for U.S. involvement across a broad range of issues related to environmental quality, conservation, water, and of course, global climate change. And he has led U.S. delegations under uh, multiple, multiple bilateral agreements and treaties. And in his role, obviously, he has always worked very closely with the Special Envoy for Climate Change and has served as the alternate chair for the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate Change. Uh, Dr. Reef Snyder has been involved on climate issues and looking at so many environment and energy issues during his work at the Department of State that goes clear back uh, to the late 80s. And indeed, he was um, the alternate head of the U.S. delegation to the negotiations in 1991 and 92 that led to the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was signed in Rio. Before going to state, uh, Dr. Reef Snyder also came from a background at NOAA. Uh, where he was for a number of years, so he brings a lot of experience coming from that scientific agency dealing with oceans and atmosphere. Dan? Well, good afternoon, and uh, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here today to give, um, to talk about the Paris Agreement on climate change. Um, I'd like to thank my good friend, Carol Werner, uh, for inviting me and also uh, say hello to my colleagues, uh, Bruno Fulda from the French Embassy and Georg Maurer from the German Embassy. Um, let me first say that I'm here not as a representative of the Department of State, um, but in my former capacity as the co-chair of the ad hoc group on the Durban platform. And I will speak from uh, that perspective today. I'd like to cover three things in the time I have. First, uh, I'd like to talk about the negotiating process that led to the Paris Agreement. Second, uh, how the negotiations differed in important respects from what might be considered more traditional negotiations. Uh, and third, some key features of the Paris Agreement. So to begin, um, the negotiations that led to the Paris Agreement officially began in 2012, following a adoption of a decision at COP17 in Durban. 
um, that established the Ad Hoc Group on the Durban Platform, or the ADP for short. Uh, the group met throughout 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015 under three different sets of co-chairs, one from a developed country and one from a developing country. Parties did not produce a negotiating text until February of last year. In fact, it was this very week last year in Geneva, I should just note, um, uh, in, G in Geneva that we had that meeting. Um, that is when my co-chair and I, Dr. Um, Dr. Ambassador Ahmed Jogloff from Algeria, uh, began our work. What we had going in were 39 pages of elements for a negotiating text that were annexed to the decision taken by the COP at its 17th session in Durban, or sorry, in, in Lima, the so-called Lima Call for Climate Action. Our job at the Geneva session was to put together a draft negotiating text before May, as called for in the Lima decision. To do this, the text had to be acceptable to all parties. This meant that the process in which it was produced had to be legitimate in the eyes of all parties. And that, in turn, meant that all parties would need to have an opportunity to provide their input. To get there, Ahmed and I asked the parties to tell us how the elements from Lima would need to be modified, what parts they wished to modify, and what additions they wished to make. We established only two rules. Um, first, that each proposal had to be read out in a plenary session so that everyone would know where it came from. And second, um, they, they had to submit their proposals to the Secretariat in writing so that we could be sure we had very clearly what each party had proposed. It was clear to us, even at the time, that what would emerge from such a process would not be a thing of beauty. And it was not. Um, the 39 pages of elements grew into the Geneva negotiating text that ran to some 86 pages. It was not, much, it was not so much a negotiating text as it was a compilation of the views of all parties. Um, still, putting together such a text in essentially the first three days in that six-week session in Geneva, or six-day session in Geneva, took people's breath away. Uh, and it created a very positive spirit, um, a very critical element given, um, a very critical element um, given the rancor and the acrimony so familiar to the UN FCCC process. Evidence of this spirit could be seen even at the outset when parties agreed to refrain from making opening statements in plenary and instead to make their statements available uh, electronically to save time. We were also able at the time to hold plenary discussions on three key issues. One was on the structure of the agreement because it was my sense that people had very different ideas in mind about what an ultimate agreement might look like. Uh, the cycles for updating the agreement uh, and the issue of markets, or what I referred to at the time as markets, non-markets, and no markets. Views were widely divergent on that issue. Uh, Geneva accomplished its task, and the Geneva negotiating text was translated into all UN languages and circulated to all parties in March of last year, uh, well in advance of the May deadline. The ADP then met thereafter in Bonn for two weeks in June. Its main task at that time became consolidating and streamlining this 86-page text and also trying to eliminate options. I forget how many options we had. In some cases, I think they approached 18 in one particular paragraph. Um, so this proved to be a very difficult task. And uh, by the end of the session, parties had managed to reduce that text by about four pages from the 86 pages that they began with. But everybody was happy, it was a good spirit, and so forth. They were just getting frustrated that things weren't going faster. Um, nevertheless, I would just tell you, several very critical things emerged um, at, that, at that June meeting. The first was that parties agreed uh, to the schedule that we had proposed, uh, and, and that included working outside the normal hours. Um, they agreed to work at lunchtime, they agreed to work into the evening, which was kind of unheard of at that point. Um, and a very, uh, a very important accomplishment if we were going to get this work done in the time we had. The second was that they agreed to work with a set of 11 co-facilitators that Ahmed and I had carefully uh, recruited to help us, uh, breaking down the, the, the work into different, different sections. Um, and again, that had been extremely controversial. Parties were very reluctant previously to 
uh, let us use co-facilitators. Um, third, they agreed to work with textual proposals that were prepared uh, by the Secretariat to help consolidate and, scream, and streamline and reduce the number of options. And that may see, this may all seem like just basic to you, but I'm telling you in that process, this was extraordinary because people were so suspicious um, and so distrustful uh, that they, they wouldn't even allow uh, the Secretariat to help them in that respect uh, very often. Um, fourth, parties almost universally urged that broad conceptual discussions be avoided. Uh, and instead, they wanted to see cons complex concepts such as differentiation and equity um, taken up in the specific discussions of mitigation, adaptation, finance, technology development and transfer, and capacity building, where having a context made them somewhat more tractable. I thought that was also quite revealing because they, uh, we've spent endless, I can't, I don't want to subtract years off my life for all the conceptual discussions we've had in the UN that just go in great elliptical circles, but this was very, uh, very positive. Fifth, um, they agreed to hold a series of side events that enabled parties who had prepared um, intended nationally determined contributions. Those are the specific actions that each country proposes to take to present what they had done and to respond to questions. Now that may seem also to you like, you know, well, what's the, what's the problem here? But there had been so much controversy generated in Lima over the issue of ex ante review. In other words, were countries going to be reviewing each other's INDCs and getting to comment on them before they were finalized? Would NGOs and others be able to do this in an official setting? highly controversial in Lima, and it ended up not going forward as part of the Lima decision. So even bringing that back, just to the extent of having these side events, we had to call them side events so people could relax, um, and then uh, have them organized in a way that people could just present what they'd done and others could learn from it was, was extraordinary in my view. To these, I might add a sixth. Um, uh, that by the end of the meeting, parties actually asked the co-chairs to help prepare uh, the next session by undertaking further elements at consolidating and streamlining the text and reducing options without omitting any views of the views of any parties. Now that again may also seem like a small thing, but in the context of the framework convention on climate change, it was huge. Um, we agreed to do so, Ahmed and I, uh, provided that we could go further in the streamlining consolidation effort and also in um, trying to reduce the number of options without taking positions off the table than what the parties themselves had done. But we also said, look, there are areas where it's clear something is going to go into the agreement, ultimately, because this agreement is only going to take effect from 2020 forward. So you can't put something that deals with um, actions before 2020 in the agreement. And they say, OK. And then we said, it's also clear that you're going to have some provisions that go into a decision. Um, and, you know, you're not going to put things like um, uh, certain things in a decision when these are, these are actions that are much nearer term. And decisions are where you spell out details of what goes in an agreement, kind of like the difference between a law and the regulations to implement the law. So they gave us permission, in effect, permission, um, to take this document and try to begin distributing these things into the appropriate category. And what we did then, we produced something for the following session. Um, that uh, began at the end of August that came to re be referred as the co-chair's tool. I won't mention all of the various inappropriate remarks people made about the co-chair's tool, but in any event, it was an effort to begin separating these things into these different categories. We, we only had three parts. One was agreement, one was decision, and one was, in effect, other. And other were a number of provisions that were very important to the final um, decision, final agreement, but where we couldn't, as co-chairs, decide where it belonged, and we needed further discussion from the parties. That was the document that we had going into the session then, after June, that took place at the end of August, beginning of September, for about a week. Um, that was... Um, very good. I think the session, once again, was very positive. People said, you know, the, the, the ambiente is good, but if they were concerned in June about the lack of progress, they became even more concerned at the end of that session in September. Um, and they felt we were moving too slowly, and it was at this point they asked us to, to undertake a more significant step forward uh, prior to the October session, um, which was the last one before Paris. 
Now, for that session, Ahmed and I produced a non-paper on the 5th of October that consisted of nine pages of agreement text and 26 articles. Uh, we also produced 11 pages of decision text. This reduced the Geneva negotiating text from over 80 pages to 20. Without doubt, the non-paper generated controversy, as you might imagine. Um, some said that we'd gone too far. Uh, they said that we'd badly miscalculated. Uh, but I believe that the October 5th non-paper was the single most important precursor to the Paris Agreement that would emerge just over two months later on the 12th of December. This is because the October 5th non-paper created a vision of what the Paris outcome might look like, and it gave parties a workable template from which to fashion the final deal. Up to that point, they had nothing but the Geneva negotiating text and a revised but still unworkable co-chair's tool. Oh, I gotta move a lot faster, sorry. Um, it's interesting that this agreement proposed uh, on October 5th ran to nine pages, that the Paris Agreement itself ultimately ran to 12. Um, the agreement proposed on October, October 5th contained 26 articles. The Paris Agreement contains 29. The decision proposed on October 5th ran to 11 pages. The decision adopted in, Par in Paris runs to, to 19. In other words, what ultimately emerged in Paris largely followed the shape and structure uh, of the vision that the parties had, uh, of the Paris outcome that we tabled in October. Um, after the October session, parties negotiated for a week in Paris ahead of the final effort that led, that the French led so ably uh, between September, December 5th, when the ADP finished its work, and December 12th, when the parties adopted the final text. Uh, the deal done in Paris was thus rooted in the negotiating process undertaken in the ADP and grew out of the work, out of the work product produced by the ADP. No alternative text was parachuted in from elsewhere, and no other negotiating process uh, sought to substitute for what, uh, that undertaken by the ADP and the Comité de Paris, which succeeded in the second week in Paris, which succeeded it, it succeeded the ADP. This was, in my view, a key ingredient to the agreement's ultimate acceptance by the parties. Now, I'd like to just quickly, if I could, address what was different about this negotiation uh, from what we'd had um, previously. Um, I've been doing this for about 41 years so far, and I've been involved in all kinds of different negotiations. And I'd like to just say, this, was, um, this negotiation really didn't begin in October in, in uh, Durban. It began well before then in Copenhagen. I say this because it was the Copenhagen Accord that began to record mitigation actions taken both by developed countries and developing countries and that thereby began to break down the firewall that had existed between them ever since adoption of the Framework Convention in 1992. It was also the Copenhagen Accord that called for $30 billion in fast start financing uh, and in which developed countries pledged to mobilize $100 billion a year by 2020 to address the needs of developing countries in the context of meaningful mitigation actions and transparency on implementation. It was also the Copenhagen Accord that decided to create the Green Climate Fund. So uh, the fact that these actions were all taken well before Paris is what is remarkable. Um, normally, these are the items of endgame in a negotiation. Uh, it's very rare that, that you don't put these on the table before the formal negotiation even begins. So um, that was the first point I found very different. Second, uh, most negotiations took place, most negotiations I've been involved with take place under a single chair, who's elected at the outset and serves until the end. Uh, the ADP had no single chair, but it had two co-chairs. And the co-chairs did not begin at the beginning and serve until the end. They were switched out three times along the way. What does this tell you about the trust with which parties approach the negotiation? Um, of a protocol, another legal instrument, or uh, an outcome with legal force under the Durban uh, decision. Um, third, it is accepted practice everywhere that the chair has latitude to propose text to the parties and that the parties accept to work with drafts that are prepared by the secretariat under the direction of a chair. In the case of the ADP, co-chairs were reminded time and again that this was a party-driven process in which the initiative should come from the parties and not from the co-chairs. So there was a great deal of distrust along the way, 
the way of those people who had been elected to help facilitate an outcome. Um, there are many other ways in which the ADP negotiations proved unlike any I've seen before, but despite these differences, they ultimately succeeded. And I'd like to just say, why is that? I would note that in Copenhagen, there was what I've described as an upstairs-downstairs problem. That is, there, were ma there was a major disconnect in Copenhagen between what took place on the second floor, literally on the second floor of the negotiating hall among some key heads of state and government, and what was taking place on the first floor between negotiations, between negotiators of all the parties. When the two gears came together, they simply didn't mesh. In addition, in Copenhagen, the negotiating text uh, on the table when the parties arrived was well over 200 pages. The COP presidency at the time undertook efforts among a subset of parties to develop a more workable uh, basis for an agreement. Uh, but when other parties learned of those efforts uh, in the press, and re they reacted very negatively to them, questioning the legitimacy of any separate process um, or text. Uh, the fear and suspicion that, that arose from that episode rippled long after Copenhagen. Fortunately, we were able to learn from the past and improve on it. First, the ADP last year was characterized by the absence of protracted discussions on process. This is because Ahmed and I met with each of the negotiating groups at length in the run-up to each negotiating session. For each session, we prepared a scenario note setting forth our thoughts on how to organize a session, and we changed the approach based on the discussions that we had with the parties. Uh, by the time we got to the formal negotiating sessions, most, if not all, of these procedural concerns had been resolved. And we also changed course as necessary in the course of the negotiating sessions themselves. Second, Ahmed and I were also clear from the outset that our in our discussions with the French presidency that the ADP should end its work by a date certain and that afterward negotiations should continue only in the COP. In other words, there should be only one negotiating process underway at any particular time in Paris. The French presidency, I can tell you, completely agreed. Uh, and we did this, uh, we worked together with the French presidency, agreeing that we should end our work in the ADP on the 5th of December. Um, and that was when we made the formal handoff that was actually televised, um, presenting to Minister Fabius the text. And third, as described, there was never any separate effort to develop a negotiating text, and the French presidency was clear on this point throughout the year, that there was no other negotiating text than that that we were producing in the ADP, and that there would be no other text. Uh, this went very far to providing the needed uh, reassurances to the parties. Uh, finally, I might add that, that France, which took over as president of the COP in Paris, and Peru, um, and Peru, which held the COP presidency through 2015 until that point, worked together hand in hand throughout the year. They held a series of meetings first in Lima and later four times at the ministerial level in Paris, not to negotiate text, but to agree on, try to explore what the landing zones might be with respect to the most difficult issues. The socialization of these issues and the process and the possible solutions they undertook among ministers and the teams that they recruited to help them went far to produce the positive outcome in December. My party, my, I guess my parting observation here is that the UNFCCC can be a difficult place in which to maneuver uh, with many constraints that are not normally encountered elsewhere. It behooves anyone coming into the UNFCC process to make no assumptions and to seek to learn the territory well in advance. In this, I recall a wonderful book written by Canada's ambassador to Washington uh, a number of year, years ago, a man named Alan Gottlieb. In, it's called, um, I'll be with you in a minute, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, and he says at the outset that notwithstanding his many diplomatic assignments elsewhere, including ambassadorships to several other important countries, um, he realized in his first week in Washington that his prior experience, however extensive, wouldn't help him here at all. Uh, that this was just too different a place and he had to start from the beginning. It's quite an amusing book, so I highly recommend it to you. Um, I have a number of points on the key features of the agreement. I think in the interest of time, I'll forego those. I'd said I'll be responding to that in the questions if you like, but um, the agreement, frankly, is so short you can read it and you can actually digest it. So thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much for those providing those insights in terms of looking at how the process um, evolved and how critical that process and the whole role of these individuals in terms of the co-chairs, but all of the parties 
who were at those meetings, how important everybody was in terms of the development of those trust relationships were in order to bring us to, to where we are. It really is an amazing story of the whole role of, of people working together and wanting something to come out at the end in a positive way. Um, so we will definitely come back and, and want to get your views with regard to some of those key elements too. And as you were leading, as you were talking also about the whole role of France and the French presidency with regard to uh, COP21, the Conference of Parties in, in Paris, uh, we thought that it was so important, therefore, to, to have uh, France be part of this briefing, to have the French government uh, uh, be represented here. And so I'm delighted to introduce Bruno Foldo, who is the Counselor for Ecology, Transportation, and Energy at the Embassy here in Washington, uh, where uh, Mr. Foldo has responsibility for uh, dealing with the United States as well as with uh, Canada. And he is a French foreign civil service with a background in financial, legal, and uh, technical issues, and has had uh, numerous responsibilities in various uh, fields of public affairs, as well as in the private sector. Uh, he's been an advisor to French transport ministers and uh, was then the chief economist and planner for an airline, to give you an example. Uh, of that and has been in charge of the economics of the French airline industry within the French government. He's held a broad range of responsibilities uh, within the French government, uh, dealing with international affairs and uh, a variety of UN agencies uh, uh, in, in terms of representing France. And one thing that I want to raise that I also thought was so important in the whole run up to Paris was the important role that uh, the embassy played here in Washington in terms of its outreach to the policy community, to the business community, to leaders in civil society, to mayors, et cetera through many, many meetings, again, uh, uh, garnering opinions, building relationships. Uh, the French Embassy uh, hosted, and Bruno was in charge of this, uh, a forum of communities for urban sustainability, um, and that was held last March. And throughout, there was this extensive work in terms of really trying to reach out and bring people together, which I think in terms of looking at the whole role of, of France with regard to hosting and, and leading uh, COP21 in Paris is really uh, quite incredible in terms of the role that they played and of course coming so quickly after the horrific bombings that had occurred just a week before. Bruno? <clears throat> Well, thanks a lot, Carol, uh, for, for inviting us. And um, I should say that you are very privileged to have um, uh, Dan Reusnieder having explained to you and that you should uh, focus your questions to that uh, guy who has so much knowledge. Every time I listen to him, I learn uh, new things, and I feel privileged to be here today, uh, be it for that reason. I'm very honored to be able to, uh, to be with you today. And um, I think I will not talk about the COP because you did that so well, um, or very briefly. I, I actually took off the part of my presentation about, about the COP. Uh, after that huge work that was done in Paris, and uh, of course, I could say we only had to work during the second week and uh, just uh, harvest uh, what um, uh, Dan Reifsnieder and his uh, Algerian colleague had prepared for so many months, uh, which was uh, almost the case. It was, it was really a, a fantastic achievement that he just described. Um, what I want to uh, focus on today is um, what we're going to do now, and why is 2016 the year uh, to be mobilized? Um, we 
Of course, we did do a, a great amount of uh, work last year, and Carol was kind enough to uh, uh, remind or describe the role of the embassies here. And, but at the end of it, we were saying, well, COP is, the, the COP21 in Paris is not the end, it's the start of a new process, and um, there is a lot to, uh, to be done. Why was it a success? Um, well, first, that mobilization that Dan has explained, the fact that it was prepared, and not only in the, in the previous months, but as long as uh, from Copenhagen, and we find in Paris many uh, uh, items that were prepared in, in, in Copenhagen. And also, I think there was, there was a willingness of many nations, uh, including this one, there was a very important role of the, of the US uh, in the success of the COP um, to make it a success. And uh, let me, um, I could have several examples. I'm thinking about, uh, when was it, November uh, 2014, when uh, there was this agreement between President Obama and, and President Xi of China. That was a game changer. The, the world thought, well, they're serious, and if China is on board, maybe we should consider. Um, but everyone, uh, well, many actors wanted to be in, and uh, one of the reasons of the success also was this uh, bottom-up approach that uh, was chosen. And that means listening to people. That's the process that uh, Dan described for, for the uh, ADP negotiations. But that's also uh, what was done. And here on the, um, on the field, we did go and talk to um, numerous NGOs, to the cities, uh, to uh, states, to provinces in Canada, and to, uh, to the business. I'll come back to that. So there was more than one year, one year preparation, and as was mentioned, when we arrived in Paris, uh, more than 180 INDC's contributions by states were on the table. That was, that was new, and that was a big, big uh, contributing factor. I just <clears throat> without being too long, just mentioned also the, uh, the action of Pope Francis. He came here, he talked. Um, that also um, was something to, uh, to be uh, taken into account. And as was very nicely reminded by, uh, by Dan, we worked very closely with Peru. As we go now to handle uh, the presidency in one year to, to Morocco, we will work with Morocco, uh, the preparation with Peru. So the association of one northern states and, well, developing countries and developed countries helped talking to uh, everyone. So globally, um, the Paris Agreement, we used to describe it in, um, in three words. And uh, probably uh, many of you remind, uh, remember, sorry, uh, the mobilization that happened in New York uh, during the Ban Ki-moon summit in 2014. Unfortunately, due to uh, the attacks in Paris, we could not rep uh, replicate that but there were 500,000 people in New York. We were expecting one million people on the street of Paris. And um, the COP was not only a big diplomatic meeting, there were also thousands of side events because everyone wanted to participate. So we used to, dis to describe the agreement as ambitious and universal. I'm gonna maybe try to be a bit quick on that, assuming that you have uh, look through it and, and you're familiar with the thing. Universal because uh, most of the, well, all the parties have signed it. And uh, ambitious because we have put the two degree uh, target in the agreement, but we have also written the 1.5 degree. And um, it describes a pathway to decarbonize the industry, the economy, and uh, to come to a picking point. And by the uh, second half of the century, neither did I. Um, go to, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, by, sorry, <laughs> by, by the middle of the century, um, come to a non-carbon um, economy if possible. So it is, and this is ambitious, and that's the way to limit the, the climate warming. The, um, the agreement is dynamic, and um, why, why did I put a ratchet instead of a huge table that you'll find in the handouts? It's dynamic because it has a lot of mechanism in, in it, including a review mechanism, which will set time by time uh, after uh, certain meeting points the, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the targets. 
Um, there will be an initial, an initial review of the efforts um, as soon as early as uh, 2018, and then there will be a formal um, meeting scheduled in, 20, in 2023. This is supposed to motivate each party, uh, each country, uh, to bolster its commitment, uh, even before the agreement comes into force in 2020, as uh, Dan Reifsinger uh, reminded you, the work that was done in Paris will uh, come into force in 2020. And also, the agreement establishes a common framework uh, of transparent, transparency so that sorry, commitments and contribution can be attracted and can be accounted for. This is a very uh, tricky or complicated or uh, specific part of, of the agreement and of the negotiation, and I think this is a, a good part of the victory. And finally, uh, the Paris Agreement is <clears throat> usually considered, what did I do? Okay, I cut it. It's considered uh, as fair and inclusive. Um, it has in itself the, the concept of differentiation between developed and developing countries. That's what the Prime Minister Modi of India calls uh, the climate justice. Um, and that applies to all subjects. So rich countries basically are responsible uh, to helping the most vulnerable, vulnerable countries. Um, and one way of doing so is through uh, their commitment to provide $100 billion per year um, as soon as 2020 in, in, in financing um, projects in the field of uh, climate. So, as I, uh, as I mentioned uh, already, the involvement of civil society was uh, very important and it did definitely played a role in the negotiations. Um, I would like, every time I meet the, a negotiator, I'd like to have those story of how the NGOs um, were part of the negotiation, they were, they were observers, how uh, the involvement, the fantastic um, implications of uh, cities, networks of cities, of businesses throughout the world uh, were helping the negotiators. And my feeling is that uh, if here we are, what, 60, if we are 60 negotiators in this room for a week and we have, we have a task to achieve or if we are in the same conditions but we know that outside this door and when we go back to our hotels tonight and for the coffee, uh, we will meet people who are as much convinced as we are but with different agenda and they talk to us, maybe we will come with some uh, different um, results. And I think that in some way that's what happened in Paris. So the civil society, we put the, all the initiatives in a big basket that we, call, we called the Lima Paris Action Agenda. Maybe that's a simplification, but under that umbrella, uh, those are the numerous initiatives, more than actually 11,000 stakeholders were presenting either in Paris at, at the COP, at Le Bourget, or within, within the city, or on the uh, website that was provided by the UN, their contribution, their commitment, their initiatives. You'll have more details in the hands out and, and uh, anywhere on the net. Um, to give you an idea, I will just quote a, a few of them. Um, one is the, um, uh, what's the first one? The first one is the, the uh, portfolio for uh, the decarbonization coalition. So, um, numerous, more than 100 companies um, committed to get out of carbon to make it easier or to provide financing uh, towards green economy. Another one is the pact. I can't see it here, so do you read the blue? Yeah. So the Paris Pact on uh, water and, and, um, and climate change adaptation, which aims at not only exchanging good practices between uh, river basins managers, but also brings a big amount of money. Another one is, uh, of course, the International Solar Alliance that you may have heard of uh, recently, and they are in every field. There is a building alliance. There is a, a building alliance for 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 uh, green uh, building or energy efficiency. There are commitments in the field of public transportation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Agriculture, forest, you name it. So um, the. Uh, DLPA 
is what we will uh, one of the one of the things we will concentrate on uh, this year. Actually, we set ourselves as the presidency. You know that France is president of the COP until we hand over the presidency to Morocco next November. Uh, so we have three priorities. Of course, the first one is to have that agreement signed and ratified. Uh, and I'll come back to that. For, maybe uh, not everyone is familiar with international negotiation, but when you have an agreement, so that it comes into force, it has to be ratified by a certain number of parties. And here it's 55% of uh, the parties which, have, which represent more than 55% of the global emission. I'd like to ask, when is that 50% measured? Is it today or later? Um, when it's ratified by that number of, of parties, it comes into force uh, at the date it is decided. The second, uh, the second priority is the preparation and implementation. Uh, as Dr. Reifsnader mentioned, there, there is the agreement and there are decisions which are part of the agreement, and I also urge you to uh, browse through it, to read it. And there are many um, issues that still have to be determined, that have to be fine-tuned. I mentioned the five-year review. I mentioned transparency. You may have heard uh, about climate finance. Uh, all those notions um, represent broad principles, and in many cases, they have to be uh, more uh, defined, uh, put into uh, national policies. And uh, that will prepare, the, that will prepare the, the implementation of the agreement. And for that, there is a process in course. Uh, there will be uh, a new meeting in Bonn in May. Bonn is where usually the negotiators for the, it's, it's the headquarters of the UNFCCC. So that's where they, they have their base, when they're not in Geneva or somewhere else. And, um, and before even they formally meet in Bonn, uh, Laurent Fabius, who is still our foreign uh, affair minister um, has uh, has prepared a meeting in April. In April, and then um, I, I mentioned it. The agreement will take into force. Will come into force in 2020. We will not wait uh, in 20, until 2020 to act. So those five years that we have in front of us should be used. And here we come back to. Uh, that LPAA, the uh, Lima Paris Action Agenda, NASCA is the name of uh, the platform or the website of the UN, uh, and the Action Day, we, start, we, we had at the COP an Action Day where civil society was invited to uh, express its commitment, and I understand that now every COP will have, um, will have an Action Day. So uh, I'm ready to conclude in a, in a few pages. Um, Again, in the immediate action, France is very much committed to, um, to, work, towards, sorry, to work towards the concretization of many of uh, those initiatives. Um, I mentioned already a few. Um, a new one, one that I did not mention is mission innovation that was proposed by President Orban, President Obama, and Bill Gates, uh, which aims at doubling the, um, the amount of money which is uh, put in research and development in uh, renewable energies, and this is uh, of uh, tremendous importance if we want to decarbonize the economy. Um, we will be working at implementing the CRUZ, which is the, the, the Climate Risk Early Warning System. It's, it's, it's a system uh, of uh, warning for vulnerable countries towards um, uh, climate uh, violent uh, climate issues. We will also uh, work to the electrification of Africa, and I, I notice actually that this uh, very Congress very uh, recently passed the uh, Electrify, Electrify Africa Bill, or Act, um, of which I'm, I'm quite happy. And I just mentioned uh, Quito, the Habitat Tree, um, which is a United Nations Conference on Sustainable Urban Development that occurs every 20 years. Um, the next occurrence is uh, next October, and this will be a very uh, good occasion, very uh, good opportunity to see the Paris Agreement in action. You cannot talk about climate development. You cannot, by the way, talk about sustainable development goals uh, and climate separately. Those three uh, issues are intermingled. So, um, 
you missed that. So all this comes to 2020. And we aim to, um, you, did, you did miss it. So red is off now. Nope. We got it back. Sorry. OK, because I have it here. So I'll go forward um, without my nice slides to tell you that, I'll tell you again, actually, how do we want to achieve those priorities? We want to pursue the negotiation. We want to implement the LPA. And um, by the way, to implement the LPA, it was decided that France and Morocco will design, designate, designate a champion, which would be a chief coordinator. I'm very happy to confirm uh, that uh, Laurence Tubiana, who was the chief uh, negotiator, has been designated uh, the French champion a few days ago. And I, today, I don't know, I think Morocco has not designed, designed um, its champion, but they have already uh, built their, their team. And um, negotiation, LPA, and there is a third issue in 2016, which is, oh, that will be, mm -hmm. pardon. Um, the third issue is things that have not been covered by the COP, and I'm talking about the maritime uh, sector, the aviation sector, or HFCs, and we will still work on that. And for example, on aviation, um, there is since, uh, last week and for, for two weeks, a big technical meeting in Montreal at the ICAO, the UN, the UN body for aviation, and they just two days ago came up with new standard for aviation, which makes it, by the way, the first global agreement of a sector on, on uh, standards on, on CO2. So work is uh, ongoing, and now where am I in my, oh, that says the same, just a bit more complicated. Here you have the negotiations with the different uh, milestones. Here you have the, L the LPA and, of course, um, the Paris Agenda, since it covers all the initiatives, is very complicated. Uh, you'll see meeting uh, with IRENA. Uh, you'll see meetings uh, of Abu Dhabi. I suppose Davos is on the slide. Uh, there, will be, um, there will be a meeting of civil society in Nantes, uh, France, by the end of the year. All this is supposed to, uh, uh, all those initiatives will converge into um, decarbonization. And here are the three uh, other domains that I just mentioned. Now I'm close to conclusion. I just want to mention that France will be mobilized more than ever. Uh, and we want to be exemplar. That, is, that means that we will be among the first one to ratify the, um, to ratify the agreement. Uh, we, we, we will post a bill in our parliament as early as May, and we hope to ratify it by, before the summer. And President Hollande will be here at the opening of the ratification process here. That means United Nations in New York on April uh, 22nd. Um, we do put a lot of money, we, we have raised our commitments from $3 billion to $5 billion um, to, uh, to contribute to, um, to, to that big um, aim of 100 billion. Um, we have raised our uh, commitments also uh, for, uh, for Africa. We want to uh, show leadership, and that means hand in hand with Morocco, um, doing a bit of what I do, uh, outreach, but mostly a lot of what Laurence Tubiana is going to do, structure the governance of that LPA, uh, play a leading role in, in the cooperation uh, project, uh, and I mentioned already a few of them. And we want to use what we call public diplomacy, uh, which, was, uh, which was what we did during the whole year to help the COP being, uh, being efficient. And since you want a conclusion, here it comes. Um, to sum it up, in 2016, uh, 2016 will be a year of action. It will be a year of mobilization. And this is, as you now I, I hope I've understood, not only for governments, uh, but for all stakeholders. As we move forward toward a cleaner, uh, less carbon um, 
less carbonized uh, world to, um, to, to, to a more resilient uh, development. It is vital, that's what we think. We think it's vital that everyone, and here again, businesses, cities, um, citizens as you, as you are, NGOs, uh, does their part to build upon the, the foundations that have been uh, developed in Paris. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. We will now turn to Dr. Georg Mao, who is the Counselor for Energy and Climate Policy at the German Embassy here in Washington. And he has uh, served in this role for uh, a, f a few years now, and prior to that had uh, played various roles, worked on a number of different uh, environmental topics with the German Environmental Protection Agency, as well as having worked with the German Federal Ministry for Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. And his whole background uh, with, uh, in, in uh, engineering and science has served him very well uh, in terms of being a very active collaborator in the ministry's development of energy policies targeted at moving the Germany uh, energy system towards greater use of renewable energy and, and much higher energy efficiency. And of course, Germany has been taking a lead role on climate and and uh, clean energy policies for decades. And so we are delighted to have Georg with us today. So at this point, we should have maybe my presentation. But yeah. anyway. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you so much, Carol, for inviting me again. Um, Just push on it. OK, cool. Thanks. Um, after Dan and Bruno so well described um, the preparation for the COP21 and what happened there and the outcome and what's next. Um, my focus will be more on um, the German implementation of uh, what is our target and uh, what is our so-called um, national contribution to the, um, to the climate policy process. Uh, but first of all, let me, let me share one observation um, around this Paris Agreement. Actually, um, from, from the German perspective, it was outstanding what we observed, uh, the role of the United States. Actually, uh, we had seen different times uh, regarding the role of the United States. I think with uh, this, particularly uh, with a proactive role and uh, with their activities um, partnering with China and with India and being so active, I think this outcome would never have happened. And uh, at the same time, uh, we also congratulate France for uh, a wonderful uh, hosting and managing the process. Um, in Germany, actually, we, we are quite happy uh, with the uh, Paris Agreement. Of course, we uh, were looking for a legally binding um, agreement in the beginning. But uh, of course, it was clear for everybody that this would not be possible. Uh, with a number of parties, particularly the United States, uh, given the situation in the Congress. Uh, so we are happy, very happy with the outcome. And um, in Germany, this is uh, the, the, the boring part. Um, not much has changed since then because the implementation of uh, what we think is necessary doesn't change so much after Paris because we did that already before. And the exciting part is we are well underway already on our development and on our energy policy, which is very crucial for implementing our climate policy. I just wanted to show you some elements, uh, what is going on in Germany, uh, where are we working at, and um, the most important part, a centerpiece of our climate policy is, of course, the uh, so-called energy transition, uh, because uh, the only chance for us to really drive down our greenhouse gas emissions is work on the energy sector. And that is why we have very ambitious targets um, all over the um, energy sector. We want to drive down the emissions, not only in the energy sector, but overall by 80 to 95 percent by 2050. Uh, with regard to renewable energies, we identified as the main source uh, which is available in Germany, uh, carbon-free source. We want to um, we want to boost the use of uh, renewable energies in the electricity sector. 
uh, and achieve at least 80% uh, in the electric, uh, electricity sector and more than 60% overall. And we think it's also important in order to achieve our other goals to improve our energy efficiency. So our target here is to uh, drive down the energy demand uh, by 50% until 2050. So with regard to renewables, we are quite well underway. Actually, just the last year, our percentage of renewable energy in the uh, electricity sector reached 30%. Uh, we came from all, almost nothing, so if you look over the last 10 years, uh, we more than tripled our uh, share of renewable energies, and it's working quite well in the electricity sector, and of course, uh, this is the best sector, that's why we always show it. Uh, with regard to, to other sectors, particularly the transport sectors, we are still working on different solutions. But uh, with regard to the electricity sector, that means we basically have to decarbonize that sector by the midst of the century. And that is uh, basically our target. So Germany, as the United States, still relies on the use of coal. So 45% of our electricity comes from coal power plants. And of course, uh, this doesn't match with our emission targets. So by the midst of this center, we, we probably will have renewables 80 to 90 percent, and then the rest uh, stemming from uh, less emission intensive gas. Uh, the process of the energy transition is a very complex one, as you can imagine, and uh, we follow it very intensively, and it's, it's a multitask project, and we have an implementation plan for, for all the important sectors. And this is basically uh, managed by the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Well, um, I wanted to present a few challenges which we have, of course, in implementing our policy. The first one is drive down the emissions. Uh, the first 20 years, we're quite successful in driving down our emissions. Our next target is minus 40% compared to 1990. Until 2020, we stand at 27%, so there's a lot of things to do. And we basically will have to uh, touch upon um, the, the coal sector, so we have to develop new measures which are very difficult to implement. Uh, and we just learned, not, not only since yesterday, that in this country it's very difficult to, um, to bring through a measure on uh, coal power plants. And um, the same is true for Germany. So uh, without the coal sector, actually, we won't uh, without achieving success in the coal sector, we won't achieve our targets, our emission targets. Uh, the second very important sector is um, using, tapping the, the saving potential in the buildings. Two-thirds of the energy spent in uh, private households is spent on heating or cooling. And um, that is where we can save 80% of our energy used. And we are working on that with giving incentives uh, for electric, uh, for energetic renovation of buildings, for example. Um, another big challenge in Germany is uh, providing for uh, a better infrastructure. And um, one major project is building electricity transmission lines between the north and the south, because we will have a lot of uh, additional wind coming from the north. And uh, we just started with offshore wind, and there will be a lot of electricity being produced in the north, uh, but our demand centers are mainly, mainly in the south and in the west. So we will need uh, high voltage transmission lines for that. And then, of course, the whole, um, the whole infrastructure has to become much more intelligent. So that is, that is a big project over the next, over the next decades. And in the long run, of course, we will need uh, storage. And then if you look at the electricity sector again, everything is about flexibility. So in the future, uh, the concept of base power will not be needed anymore. We are looking for flexibility solutions, including uh, storages, including demand response, including uh, smart grids. So that is basically uh, what is ahead of us and how we are implementing um, the the climate policy and our climate targets. 
this is uh, maybe a, a first take from, from the German perspective. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, I think that we've seen a lot of the costs um, of wind and solar, and particularly offshore wind, um, those costs have really been driven down by the um, much earlier deployment of those technologies by Germany uh, than, it, because Germany's really led the world in terms of, of um, very, very rapid deployment, which has really, really helped the economics uh, for everybody else, I must say. Uh, so let's open it up for your questions or comments, and if you could just identify yourself, please. Okay? How did the Supreme Court decision yesterday affect the Supreme Court? Um, yeah. Affect the U.S. standing from a Paris perspective? How, how is our country now looked at since this decision was made? Thank you. Well, maybe, can we move that thing from back? Um, because actually, I don't see that part of the slide. Okay. So, sorry. That's, um, that's fine. Go ahead. Stand here. That's fine. The point is, I do not. I don't have any answer to that. Uh, first, it is an it is an internal matter, and I'll be very interested to see how it um, develop here. I could refer to my colleague, but I don't think that the Department of State would have any comment on that. And um, what I just a very personal feeling is um, that from what I've what I've um, seen, sorry, on on the ground, uh, talking with uh, uh, governors, uh, with local EPAs, and also with um, utilities, the fact that the clean power plan was uh, written and was negotiated for years um, made that the industrialists have taken it into account, even if they oppose it. They are making plans just in case uh, it is compulsory or not. And they are working uh, several hypotheses. I've been, well, so um, they're planning ahead with different hypotheses. And only that uh, has a positive impact on decarbonization. And now I shall not comment on, on something which is very new and internal. Thank you. Uh, maybe I could. could. Add a little bit. I mean, what, what we heard so far from, from the White House uh, and from the EPA is that there are, of course, no plans to, to change anything uh, around the, the, um, the agreement, the Paris Agreement. So um, they are not afraid of achieving the, the targets. But of course, it's a centerpiece of their uh, climate policy. Um, and I agree with Bruno, what we see on the ground is that a lot of things are already happening uh, in terms of implementing the uh, Clean Power Plan. And on the other side, I mean, uh, I just learned that last year, for instance, 14 gigawatt of uh, power plant capacity was um, shut down due to economic reasons. So this is a process which is uh, happening anyway. And of course, the extension of the uh, tax credits for renewable energies will play a role. And so all together, I mean, we all, all hope for the best that the Clean Power Plan will be implemented in the one or other way. But even uh, without uh, immediate implementation, we see the things are already happening. But of course, uh, at the end, this could, be, this could mean that um, the Supreme Court decides in a, uh, let's say, in a not supportive way in the end, and the clean power plan might not survive the way it is now. But still, we see uh, there's a lot of uh, reason why this development uh, will maintain. Um, thanks, because I think that everyone is sort of looking at this whole issue, and and obviously, as both speakers uh, made clear, there is so much that is already underway. And in fact, I know that there are meetings here in town this week involving state regulators and uh, state energy officials uh, looking at how things are moving forward. Um, over here.
Hi, Dean Scott, Bloomberg BNA here in DC. I guess my question is also uh, for um, our friends from France and Germany to ask a little bit about uh, the way in which we created the agreement in Paris in terms of having a pledge-based system. Does the Supreme Court decision sort of raise questions in terms of the detail that countries were to put forth in, 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 their, uh, in their INDCs, which is rather vague in terms of where each party was to get its emissions reduction. And here we are sort of in this question, these questions have been raised by the court decision on a key component of, of one country's pledge. I'm not sure I totally got the question. Is it that uh, INDCs are not very precise and we are not sure how they will be enforced? Well, for example, the U.S., if you look at the U.S. Uh, pledge, it's INDC. It's rather brief. It's a few pages, I think, at best. So that, that's the question. And, and so it doesn't, and it doesn't really, I, I believe, even suggest how much of its emissions reduction is to come from the clean power plan. So I'm saying in terms of, you know, what does it get from this one policy that's now under attack? So what I'm saying is looking back, should we have had more uh, specifics from countries to put real more meat on exactly how they were going to get to the emissions reduction they were pledging in the first place? Well, here I think you are going into the detail and mechanism of the negotiation. And, and it was brilliantly explained uh, at the beginning that it is a bit complicated to have uh, 200 countries agree on something. and. Uh, that is the next step, actually. Um, this transparency, this, uh, those ways of uh, mechanism of reviewing by the pairs, um, that will be, that will be a, a way to monitor what people do. Now, what they will actually do uh, effectively uh, is left to uh, every country, and we have not, for the time being, set up a, a blue helmet force to uh, go and enforce in the countries what they have committed. I think that one of the, maybe two things which are more or less the same, uh, very briefly, the momentum that was in Paris. And the fact, uh, I've, talked, I've talked about millions of people on the street. Uh, mm -hmm. I won't be long on that because you, you all have seen that there was a mobilization around the world. Uh, and that come, and the second point is name and shame. Uh, if governments don't do uh, what they have committed to do, there will be pressure uh, by, the, by the street. I know a bit of China. China, um, I wouldn't declare, is a democracy like uh, here or in Europe. Nevertheless, in China, environment is a very sensitive issue, and the people, the real people, we the people on the street, um, they, they pressure their government on, on, on those issues. Does that answer? Um, Dan, do you want to talk about that yes. piece of the process a little bit more in terms of these commitments and what was involved in that and the, that process? I think that'd be really helpful. Okay. Sure. Um, well, as Bruno said, um, it, it, trying to get 200, close to 200 countries to do anything, even to agree, you know, on what time of day it is, is a rather big deal. Um, and uh, I think what we had, what's, what's remarkable to me about the Paris Agreement is just how robust it is, uh, given all of the concerns uh, that, that countries had. And one of the ways we dealt with that was by saying, okay, we'd like you to come forward and we'd like all, all countries to come forward and put your contributions on the table, um, which is what they did. In fact, as we came to Paris, I think we had nearly 190 countries had come forward with INDCs, which was, I mean, it frankly staggered everyone. No one had any idea that we would do that well uh, prior to the Paris, uh, the, the beginning of the Paris negotiation. Um, and that commitment that they've made in those INDCs is an initial uh, commitment. I mean, it's, it's one um, under the agreement that is nationally determined. So each country decides what to do and, and how to approach it. But then each country has agreed that that will be uh, updated periodically on a, essentially on a, um, well, I think ultimately will be on a five-year um, cycle. 
uh, in terms of the mitigation commitments. And I think it's quite remarkable. It leads, it's, we knew that these INDCs, even though there were 100, nearly 190 of them, everyone knew it was very clear from a number of studies that had been done, they would not add up to minus two degrees, much less minus 1.5, which was the, um, you know, one of the objectives of the agreement. So then the question became, okay, well, what are you gonna do? Well, what we're gonna do is we have this fairly rigorous process in which we're going to be periodically renewing those commitments and discussing those commitments. And it's not so much the pressure that comes from governments pointing the finger at each other as it is from countries putting these out publicly for review and consideration by everyone, other governments, but NGOs, think tanks, uh, analytical groups, and so forth. It's that public pressure um, in light of the concerns that people have about climate change that we think is going to lead to, ultimately, to the kind of action um, that is needed to attain the objectives. But trying to do too much in the beginning, you say, should we have been more specific in Paris? Um, I don't think so, because I think we ended up in Paris with something that was really remarkable for what we were trying to accomplish. And it's, it's, a, it's a beginning. It's not the end of the process, as, as Bruno mentioned. Yeah, maybe a small comment on, on the, the gap you were talking about. I think that's, that's a correct uh, observation. There is, of course, a gap uh, if you compare the reduction uh, from the INDCs and then the implemented policies. And of course, there's always a gap. So, I mean, few people here calculated that might be 50, 60, 70 million uh, CO2 tons equivalents. In Germany, it would be around 20 or 30 million, million tons. That is true, but I think that's that's the very nature of um, a target. So uh, you start with a target, and then of course uh, you have to implement more. You have to do more than only the today's implemented policies, and that's exactly what we're looking forward to. Okay, uh, here first. Okay. But I also represent a parliamentarian in Australia. Um, Australia has been the first country to go backwards on climate change policy. Um, recently, the, Tony Abbott, well, the former Tony Abbott government um, got rid of the carbon tax. How does the Paris climate deal react to actions like these? And what are the contingency, what, what are the contingency plans if countries underperform to the targets they have set? Um, is it just that they get shamed for not doing it or is there actual sort of reaction um, where countries will actually pressure more than just, oh, you didn't do it. <laughs> Dan, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, without, without uh, actually, I was going to flip and try to quote you some things from the agreement itself, but the, the notion is that countries will come forward with uh, nationally determined contributions and that the successive nationally determined contributions will be more progressive than the last. So that's, there's nothing that, that um, people are exhorted to do this. Now, you can adjust uh, your contributions along the way if you, if you have to, but the, the effort, uh, the, all the trends are forward and to progressively lower greenhouse gas emissions because that's what we think the science is gonna demand. So in terms of are there penalties for not doing this? Will people come after you? What, what we found, I think, in many other um, global environmental agreements is that even when someone is found to be in violation of a commitment, for, for example, or not meeting a commitment, uh, it's very rare that anyone goes after them. In, uh, there's no, there's no uh, court where you can sue them. And the whole issue is how do we help them? get back into compliance, because at the end of the day, you're not so much interested in penalizing them as you are in helping them to achieve compliance. That's the goal of the agreement, and that's the notion behind this. It's much more facilitative than it is punitive. Okay, over here. Hi, uh, Tim, uh, Tim Judson with the Nuclear Information and Resource Service. Um, I think you know, we share the, you know, the, the optimism of the, you know, the implications of the agreement. Um, and I think, but I think, you know, a lot of the NGO community uh, has been very ambivalent about the lack of specificity in terms of what the path is to get to the, you know, the goals that are laid out in the agreement. And I think especially in terms of, um, you know, the, um, the, the Green Climate Fund and exactly what, you know, those, that very large pot of money is going to be spent on. And um, I think there's a lot of sense that, um, that, you know, one of the, one of the areas of contestation was about, 
what solutions or what, 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 what is the path to, to reducing emissions and what's that money going to be able to be spent on? And I wonder if you can sort of talk to, you know, kind of what the process is going to be for defining, you know, what the Green Climate Fund can actually be used for. Well, thanks. Um, I think the Green Climate Fund and, the, and the, the pledges that were made to this, there were two things in, in Lima that really put wind in the sails. And one was mentioned, which was uh, the agreement between the United States and, and China, the joint announcement, if you will, or the announcement, simultaneous announcements of their plans. The other were the over $10.2 billion in pledges to the Green Climate Fund, because um, this was a radical departure, this agreement from the past, in the sense that developing countries were being asked to come forward and take commitment, take, take action. It was no longer confined to the developed countries. And their concern was, well, wait a minute, are, is there going to be enough money? Is there going to be enough technology and capacity building and the help that we're going to need to do these things? Um, associated with this agreement, and that's where the, the Green Climate Fund, as I mentioned, it was established in, in Copenhagen. And last year, um, I know there was a big push to actually come up with the first, I think there were eight projects that were funded prior to, the, prior to Paris, prior to the beginning. It was very important to demonstrate to countries that not only is the money there, but projects are going forward. Now, there's been an agreement that there would be a 50-50 split between adaptation on the one hand, or trying to mitigate the, it was, well, I shouldn't use the word mitigation and adaptation, trying to uh, increase resilience and, and um, uh, help countries uh, deal with the adverse impacts of climate change on the one hand, and mitigation, which is essentially to reduce, avoid, or sequester greenhouse gas emissions on a grant or equivalent basis, I should mention that. So there is this notion that adaptation and mitigation should be um, uh, at, at a certain par, and there's increased focus Focus because for many developing countries, um, even if they stopped emitting tomorrow, it wouldn't change the ultimate path of, of global emissions. It's really their concerns have much more to do with adaptation. Uh, and it's also our concern because we've seen um, it, over the course of time that if problems are not dealt with within countries, they become international problems. So, Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, back here and then we'll come up here. Yes, thank you for a, a great panel. Um, Dan Wildcat, a UCHI member of the Muscogee Nation, a faculty member of Haskell Indian Nations University and convener of the Indigenous Peoples Climate Change Working Group. Uh, I want to know how come there's no mention of indigenous peoples and obligations, responsibilities that larger governments have to the indigenous peoples of those lands in the body of the document. There's some language in the preamble and there are uh, appended requisitions where it speaks to indigenous issues. But I think given the fact that many indigenous peoples around the globe are living in vulnerable uh, environments where they are really going to be the first to affect some of the most devastating features of, of climate change, whether they're in the uh, central rainforest of Brazil uh, uh, fighting dams uh, or whether they're uh, in coastlines that are very vulnerable or, or uh, desert and very arid areas where uh, tenuous uh, sort of uh, maintenance of life is, is maintained. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed that with the presence of indigenous peoples in large numbers at COP21 that there was no inclusion actually in the agreement itself um, regarding those, those issues of indigenous peoples. Well, thanks. I think, um, first of all, there's a widespread recognition of the concerns um, uh, of indigenous peoples and the impacts of climate change on indigenous peoples in, in, in their communities. And as you noted, um, there is recognition in this agreement, in the preamble, of uh, the rights of indigenous peoples. But your question is, why don't you have something operative in the operative section of the agreement? And there I can just tell you that it's all part of this negotiation. Um, it's very difficult. Some of these issues, uh, some of the issues we were dealing with raise very sharp concerns among certain countries and what you could negotiate and how far you could go was just a matter of trying to see what the balance would be and, and where, we could, where we could make progress. So I think we have it in the preamble. Uh, there is wide, widespread recognition of the rights and the concerns of indigenous peoples. It wasn't possible to go further in the body of the agreement at that time.
Hi, uh, Ori Guten with the Center for American Progress. And this question's uh, for Mr. Folda. So you talk a lot about this year kind of working with Morocco to transition leadership over the COP. And so Morocco has recently been developing as a clean energy leader, uh, but throughout most of the MENA region, um, clean energy has fallen far behind and emission cuts have fallen far behind. Um, <clears throat> and Saudi Arabia in past years has been uh, like an inhibitor to conversations on climate negotiations. So how do you think that Morocco could use its leadership and its host status of COP22 to kind of facilitate greater transition to a clean energy embrace in the MENA region overall? In other words, you're, you're asking me what would be the road, the road map for Morocco uh, for uh, preparing the COP22 and the year after that. Sure. <clears throat> well, um, I'm not reversed on that. My, my feeling is that after the COP21, which was the big meeting point uh, announced um, and uh, looked for since Copenhagen, which sets the rules for 2020, as I said, and as we all said, <clears throat> a lot of work is still to be done in precising the details. And I'm sure that the role of Morocco will be to first work with us uh, as soon as now uh, to go as far as possible to, towards the preparation of Marrakesh. And then, also, uh, I see the quality and the enthusiasm of the negotiators. I'm not sure that everything will be um, finished by the, by the end of this year, so there will still be a lot on the table for Morocco to address. Okay, last question. Okay, back here. Okay, could you take the mic? Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Patrick Venezuela, and I'm with Senator Schumer's office. And my question is this. It, I know the, in order for ratification, it requires 55 nations, to, which comprise among 55% of the world's carbon producers, to get ratified. My question is this. How important is it for the United States to sign on to this bill, and, uh, to sign on to this agreement? If the United States, for some reason, whether it be the Supreme Court or other legislative battles, isn't able to sign on, is this... Uh, treaty dead in the water, or what would you say you're optimistic that it can get ratified elsewhere? Can I say well, I think first it is important for the United States to, uh, uh, to ratify and to have a very uh, uh, tenuous and strong action against climate change, be it only for uh, for the health and well-being of its own citizens. Um, and that's, uh, that's something that most of the scientists around the world, and including this country, would agree with. Uh, second, regarding uh, the agreement itself, I don't have in mind the numbers, I'm sure you do, um, whether the non-signature by the US would um, uh, make the, 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 the global amount Fall, uh, short, sh fall short of the 55 percent. I'm not really sure. And on the other hand, I do not envisage the U.S. not signing. Yeah. Well, I could just, I mean, I'd like to answer on sort of two levels. On the, on the first level, the technical official level, um, would, you know, the United States not signing on to this agreement prevent its entry into force? No. I mean, there are enough other countries that make up a significant enough percentage, uh, and there are enough other countries that could go forward, I think would go forward. I mean, evidence of that is the Kyoto Protocol, where the United States didn't sign on to the Kyoto Protocol, um, uh, and, and that entered into force nonetheless. The question is, how effective would any agreement be without the United States? And I think that's what Bruno was just uh, answering, and, and I guess in my own experience, um, it's quite important for the United States to take part in this global effort. Uh, 
Um, because not only because the United States, uh, our own emissions are so significant uh, in comparison with other countries, but also because we have the resources in terms of the people, the technology, the know-how, the innovation, that we're a crucible of innovation in this country, and it's quite important to solving this problem globally that we engage and that we take part. And, and I think what the bigger concern I would have is the signal that it would send to the rest of the world about how serious we are about the problem. I think the signal has been very positive up to this point. Um, I think um, it's very important that we keep it positive. Go ahead, Bruno. Uh, thanks, Carol. I, I would like to, to add uh, another point that we did not discuss much today, and just rebounding on what Dan said, uh, not only um, in terms of, well, it is uh, a matter of signal, but uh, addressing the climate change is also building a whole new green economy, new or newer, and that that is the creation of uh, hundreds and thousands of jobs. And it is also developing an industry. Uh, we insisted on the capacities of Germany uh, in certain uh, field of renewable energy, and they're doing that not only uh, on on their own in their own country, but then they can export technology. Um, we all know that to decarbonize, we have to work on uh, energy storage, on better batteries, on smart grids. Um, uh, Georg mentioned that about Germany. Uh, those technologies um, will be developed here, there, and if the US is not on board, they will lack a bit of credibility to export their, their, their own capacity. So in terms of economics, I think it's also an argument. Okay, thank you very, very much. And I think as, as we've heard today, and I want to thank our wonderful panel because this has just been uh, an extreme wealth of experience and of knowledge and in terms of providing us all some insights about the process what else has been involved, what is part of this agreement, the kinds of momentum and commitments of countries around the world, I think is really quite incredible. And now there will be obviously need to be a lot of vigilance in terms of going forward, in terms of knowing what we know, in terms of the transparency of the process and the ongoing review that is scheduled to happen on a five-year every five-year basis. And I think that as our panelists have also talked about the kinds of changes that we're already seeing in the United States, in, uh, in their respective countries, with regard to many different kinds of actions and activities that are already happening on the technology side and um, on whether it's adaptation and resilience or in terms of looking at mitigation efforts. Um, EESI will be pursuing a variety of briefings during this year, looking at various technology issues, as well as looking at some of the other issues that are coming up in the Clean Power Plan. Just want to mention that we will have a briefing on uh, February uh, 25th, I believe it is, that is looking at some of the environmental justice issues in conjunction with the Clean Power Plan. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank our terrific panel. And if you've got questions or whatever, please do follow up with our panel members or with the ESI. Happy to help you uh, look at this issue more fully. Thank you all very, very much.